Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we bring you stories about some of the consumer goods you may use every day. In North Carolina, we learn how a once thriving furniture company suddenly went belly up. And in California, we explore the growing market for more diverse dolls. But we begin with an issue that's affecting many innovative brands. A number of inventors have alleged their big ideas for products are copied by companies using the As Seen on TV logo. CBS News correspondent Chanel Call speaks with entrepreneurs who are seeking to protect their intellectual property. And then you just flip to get the angle that works best for your body position. 12 years ago, Without inventor Juliet Bassett says she came up with the idea for something she called Flippy. Flippy is a three-dimensional soft tablet stand for your iPad or any other kind of tablet. Seven years later, after she says she poured hundreds of thousands of dollars of her own money into developing and creating her now fully patented Flippy, she got her big break on QVC. Let me update you now that we brought over 15,000 of these for our show this morning. I have 800 left in gray only. We've we sold, sold half a million dollars worth of product remaining. in about 13 minutes. I mean, good grief, we could sell out a couple of these. Right. I mean, it was huge. Despite Flippy's proven popularity, when Facet offered the product to a major retailer, she was shocked they said no. I just thought, wow, that's really weird. So that was in January, and then in February, a girlfriend uh, called me from L.A. and said, hey, there's a flippy ripoff on late night cable. When you need to get comfortable, you need Pillow Pad 360. It Soon, that flippy lookalike was on store shelves across the country, packaged with a logo as seen on TV. When I discovered who it was, I was like, that's just wrong. So you just connect it up to the hose. Josh Malone says he had a similar experience with his invention, Bunch of There's Balloons, designed to fill and seal dozens of water balloons oh, in seconds. And they're pretty full now, so I'm going to give it a shake. Hi, I'm Josh Malone, inventor of Bunch of Balloons. In 2014, Malone's prototype on Kickstarter took off, gaining national media coverage. We raised almost a million dollars from 22,000 supporters. And what happened next? I eventually connected with a company called Zuru. We had signed a deal to go into mass production. In the production. first month? Yes. But then? Just a few months after Kickstarter, a friend of my wife said, I saw a knockoff of your bunch of balloons on TV. Balloon Bonanza, the new way to fill and seal mountains of water balloons freaky fast. And I found out who's behind this, a company called Telebrands. They're the as seen on TV company. Balloon Bonanza got a jump on the market before a bunch of balloons had even gone into production. How did they beat you to it? They actually were surreptitiously monitoring Kickstarter. And so unbeknownst to me, I actually shipped one of my first editions of Bunch of Balloons to a Telebrands representative. And they immediately turned around, sent it to their factories in China and said, give us a million of these in blue. As they slide down, aqua sealing technology ties them tight. I wonder how you squared that moment where you saw a version of something that you created after getting a patent for that. The patent was in process at the time. I believed in the laws of the United States. And I really thought a patent would protect you. But as a practical matter, multi-billion dollar, trillion dollar now corporations just don't care. Because Malone had partnered with a major distributor, they together had the time and the millions of dollars it took to litigate. After a four and a half year legal battle, a judge agreed that Telebrands was not only liable, but willful in infringing, doubling a jury's award. With attorney's fees, the total came to $31 million. I was a fluke. Be able to spend millions and millions of dollars on attorneys, who else can do that? Every other case, it's the copycat that is the market leader. We found nearly 100 lawsuits brought against Telebrands and Ontel over the last three decades for allegedly infringing on intellectual property. A 2008 suit against Telebrands called the company scam artists with a long history of palming off and stealing other people's ideas. Another suit called Telebrands founder A.J. Kubani the infamous knockoff king of the infomercial industry. Many of these suits were settled, small comfort for inventors like Juliet Fassett, who feel forever robbed of the American dream. 
I can't stand bullies. And um, these bullies just happen to have millions and millions and millions of dollars of what should be my money. From industry to agriculture, Florida's citrus producers are in crisis. Severe weather and disease have had drastic effects on the supply of fruit, and it's driving up prices. CBS News correspondent Christian Benavides learns about the high-tech race to help save the Sunshine State's iconic crop. Glenn Beck is a fourth generation Florida farmer. His grandfather started growing citrus in 1887. Never before has there been a series of events that led to a downfall of, of an industry such as what citrus has experienced. Beck says virtually all of his 5,000 acre citrus groves are infected with a bacterial disease carried by the tiny Asian citrus psyllid. Citrus greening has plagued Florida farmers for almost two decades. The leaves and fruit don't receive the nutrients that, that they should until eventually the tree dies. Research in genetic therapy was applied to help the trees tolerate the disease from within and individual protective covers, known as IPCs, provide safekeeping from without. Those efforts are bearing fruit just in time for this upcoming season. If we get some solutions in there, uh, we, we can start to rebuild. While Beck expects to pass this on to the next generation, he believes he'll still lose about half the acres of orange groves that he owns by the end of the year. Matt Joyner with the trade group Florida Citrus Mutual says at its peak, 300 million citrus boxes were produced. Last season, we ended it right at 18 million boxes of citrus, so about a 90% decline. And many Florida packing houses now sit empty, down to only 25 from over 100 in the 1980s. Hurricanes and a December freeze both wiped out groves, which take about four years to recover before harvest. And consumer consumption is down for OJ, while land development is up, which helps accelerate the decline. This season, however, could be a turning point. I think that our production is going to be somewhat flat, but that's actually a victory. A victory shared by University of Florida researchers because science has slowed the decline. They are among many scientists who study what makes citrus trees more tolerant to greening. They're tolerant, so they, they support the, t the bacterial growth inside of them without dying. You think there's hope? Absolutely. I know there's hope. Growers need the therapies to work with their livelihood at stake. Coming up, how an American success story turned into an overnight failure. This is Eye on America. Welcome back. Furniture company Mitchell Gold and Bob Williams was celebrated for decades for its stylish American-made products. That was until the company unexpectedly folded in August of 2023. Brooke Silva Braga shows us the abrupt collapse and the impact it's had on hundreds of employees. Remind me, how long were you working there? Uh, this January, the 16th would have been five years. But now it's shut down. Yeah, for some reason. The reason is what this story is about. Veronica Wisnet is one of 700 Americans who lost their job when Mitchell Gold went bankrupt. More than half of those 700 live in and around Taylorsville, North Carolina, population 2,300. Saturday, August 26th, we were sent an email telling us that the business had closed. Essentially, we were without a job. And I think it said you'd be paid for two more months. Yes, 60 days past when we were let go. Which is the law. Yes, uh, but no, None, nobody has gotten any money. People around here must be upset. Very upset, yeah, very upset. How can hundreds of employees get stiffed out of their severance? How can thousands of customers be stuck paying for tens of millions of dollars of furniture they'll never get? How can Mitchell Gold's parent company walk away from those debts, even while it controls nearly $2 billion in assets from the other companies it owns? The simplest way to explain it is probably starting at the beginning. Well, when Bob and I started the business in 1989, 
our whole idea was to just have this great little jewel of a company. Mitchell Gold had been a buyer for Bloomingdale's. His partner, Bob Williams, was a designer. And the furniture they made sold so quickly, they struggled to keep up with demand. I was a history major in college. I didn't really understand how to finance a business, how to build the business financially. It was, it was very stressful and it was growing fast and we had an offer that was very, very attractive. So in 1999, they sold the business, but kept running it. So this is the final, this is, this is great. But every five or 10 years, a new buyer took over. And everything we made kept selling. And in 2014, with Gold's blessing, the Stevens Group, a private equity company, bought the business. The basic pitch was, you'll get bigger and we'll run you a little better. Right. And did it happen? Huh, not, 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 not exactly that way. So let's talk for a minute about what private equity even is. Instead of buying stocks on Wall Street, some very big investors buy whole companies and try to flip them a few years later. The positive case for private equity, um, and I'm sort of paraphrasing what their advocates say, is that it's a sort of heat-seeking missile for profits. Brendan Ballou is no advocate. He's a lawyer with the Justice Department, but spoke to us in his personal capacity as the author of Plunder, private equity's plan to pillage America. It's a way to use sort of loopholes in our bankruptcy and liability laws to extract the benefits from things when things go well, but essentially walk away when they go poorly. That's because, Ballou says, they're risking other people's money. Buying up retailers. Taking big loans to make the purchase and then loading that new debt onto the company they just bought. Yeah, yeah, this is a J. Crew suit. It went bankrupt in part because of private equity ownership. To be clear, many companies bought by private equity grow dramatically, but many others fail completely. One study found that private equity portfolio companies were 10 times as likely to go bankrupt as those that weren't owned by private equity firms. Why would you be more likely to go bankrupt? Because private equity firms both load the companies up with debt and private equity firms are able to extract money from them. Normally, a company does not want to go bankrupt, or if it goes bankrupt, it's a loser for the owners of the company. That's not necessarily the case uh, with private equity owners. They've already got their money out of the company. Exactly. We have not seen any documents that show whether these practices happened in the case of Mitchell Gold, but here's what we do know. It's a tale of failure played out in three acts. First, imperfect management. For years, profits weren't great. So in 2019, Gold turned over the CEO job to Allison O'Connor. But in the face of COVID, her push to improve profits instead led to massive losses. Needing a bailout, the Stevens Group injected $39 million in Mitchell Gold. PNC Bank extended more credit too. And O'Connor, who declined to speak on the record, was replaced by Chris Moy. But the stress of those losses set the stage for Act Two of the collapse. The Federal Reserve raised a key interest rate by a quarter of a percentage point. With interest rates climbing, PNC Bank appears to have decided Mitchell Gold was too big of a risk. Moy says the bank declared their loan in default, not for a missed payment, but for missing paperwork that was submitted a couple hours later. In a statement, PNC Bank told us it strongly rejects any suggestion that it caused or contributed toward Mitchell Gold's current financial condition. So then, Act 3. Without the help of borrowed money, would the private equity owners keep Mitchell Gold alive? Moy says he told the Stevens Group they could stage a comeback with about $30 million of additional help. Or, for less than $20 million, they could close the company but first pay employees their severance and make the furniture customers had already paid for. The Stevens Group declined. Instead, it transferred ownership of Mitchell Gold from North Carolina to business-friendly Delaware, then declared bankruptcy without paying employees or customers. I loved, loved working there. Some of those employees and some of those customers are now suing. You must look back at the last 34 years and say, ah. Oh. I wish I could have that one back. Yeah. And that's what? I regret selling the company in the first place and losing control. Ahead, meet the toy makers creating dolls with features that reflect all of America's kids. That story's next.
We close our show with an important note on the big business of playtime. Sales of dolls in the United States totaled more than $3 billion in 2022. Now there's a growing push to manufacture dolls with more inclusive skin tones and hairstyles. I sat down with some of the women behind the effort to better reflect the backgrounds and appearances of the children who play with them. I mean, you have <laughs> hairstyles. We do. Of like every persuasion. Yes, we do. Dee Dee Wright Ward's obsession with dolls stems from her mom. Started with her incredible sense of, of self and individuality, but also blackness and pride with her textured hair. Textured hair is the selling point of Wright Ward's Naturalistas. Our tagline for Naturalistas is be proud of your crown. That's how we refer to our hair, it's our crown and glory. It's the first all black line of fashion dolls sold in major retailers with natural hairstyles that run the cultural gamut. You can wash it, you can style it, Look you can braid it. We wanted to cover all spectrums. You know, not only is long hair beautiful, also medium length hair, also short hair, also tightly coiled, also loose curls. What does this enable a kid to do? If, you know, it enables a kid to, to feel like they have a place and a sense of belonging in the world. Ward launched her line in 2022 as states and cities passed legislation inspired by the Crown Act, which prohibited race-based hair discrimination. It's protecting people, um, protecting their, their right to show up exactly as they are and to take up space ex exactly the way God made them. Black people want to be lovingly represented. Folklore scholar Phyllis May Machunda has traced the untold story of black dolls all the way to slavery and the effect of their absence in mainstream culture, as seen in the work of psychologists Kenneth and Mamie Clark. What they realized is that oppression worked in much of the black community because they weren't hearing their stories. The so-called doll test showed that black children preferred white dolls, seeing black dolls as inferior. What they did was, in their research, use the test to say segregation, especially in education, is destructive to black people, black children. That experiment helped convince the U.S. Supreme Court to strike down segregation and helped efforts already underway to mass produce black dolls, from civil rights activists like Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. Du Bois to opera singer Leontine Price. Trying to find a doll that was realistic, authentic, um, in its representation of black people. And then you started seeing dolls with more natural hair. Setting the stage for the dolls we see today. So this is headquarters. This is where all the creativity and magic happens. MGA Toy Company exec Jasmine Larry and Heckman witnessed that magic 20 years ago with the Bratz brand. You have hair that's colored and then you have the curlies along with the straight. The, I mean, you have such variety. Of course, that's what the world is. That's what our friends are like. She was 11 when her dad, the CEO of the world's largest independent toy company, greenlit their production. These big box retailers, when we first launched it, they all wanted to be shipped mainly the blonde and blue-eyed doll named Chloe. And Isaac, my father, said, listen, this is the Bratz Pack. This is a group of girlfriends. You either buy all four, they come shipped in a case pack of all four characters, or you get none. That was pretty gutsy. Very. Huge risk. Kind of bratsy. Exactly. <laughs> For a time, Bratz outsold even Barbie, thanks in part to that ethnic diversity. But their swagger was criticized too, as some parents found them too racy for little kids. Bratz has seen a revival in sales and social media. This line changed the trajectory, focus, intention of an entire industry. Why did it take so long? I think sometimes it just takes one person to take a risk. And I saw myself in these dolls 
And so if I was so excited and saw that, I think it was obvious to our team here and my dad that this is something that's desperately needed in the toy aisle. With new companies like Healthy Roots joining the game, it's a chance for the toy aisle to look more like the real world. And as Wright and her naturalistas show, create dolls for everyone. You mentioned that you have boys. Yes. Products coming out. Our first product is Greg. Um, and in the way that I designed a doll in celebration of my mother, he's a doll that I designed in celebration of my father. Um, and it comes with his hair texture and his handsome face and his, you know, big, funny, outstanding personality. And this is a celebration of black brotherhood through the connection of barbershop culture and how they celebrate and express themselves through their hair. So we're celebrating this through toys. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.